Okay. Uh, welcome, everybody, to our podcast, the Aftermarket Champions podcast, uh, hosted by Entitl. Uh, my name is Vivek Joshi. I'm the founder and CEO of Entitl. And with me today, I am pleased to have our next guest, Tony Black, uh, who is the president of services for Husky in uh, Toronto, Calif- uh, Toronto, Canada. Uh, I met Tony, actually, as it turns out, a very long time ago in business school, and then the paths crossed again recently. And uh, the more I learned about his background, the more I thought it was quite interesting for us to learn, uh, to understand how he came to, and uh, not just his current role, but the roles he had in services before this. And so I asked Tony to come on as a guest, and he's uh, graciously accepted my invitation. So without further ado, I want to introduce uh, Tony Black. Uh, Tony, welcome to the show. Thanks, Vivek. It's, it's nice to be here today and good to be uh, talking and just sharing experiences. Um, yeah, looking forward to... Uh, to, to talking and uh, just giving everybody an update on what, what's going on here and a little bit about my background. Great. So with that, Tony, can you tell us a little bit of background? I know I, I mentioned that you're the president of Husky Services today, uh, but you've had a very interesting career to date uh, before you joined Husky. So maybe a little bit of a background, and also a little bit about what Husky does. Uh, so it'll give people a framework of reference, if you may. Yeah, sure. Um, so just, yeah, let's start with Husky. Um, first of all, Husky is a, it's a, it's a great company, um, really a industry leader, uh, also, um, a fa- kind of a, a technology innovator and, and really, I would say started the industry or started with the industry, uh, in, in really how to industrialize, um, injection molding technologies. And, um, so Husky started here in Canada um as a as a um an entrepreneur started the company and the company has really developed into an industry leader in injection molding technologies um everything from solutions for packaging for food water medical and and any other type of uh injection molding applications and technologies um, the, the, the company, the brand is in, in this space. The brand is really the, the leader. It's, um, which, which really is exciting the, the people that work here, um, have worked here a long time. So there's a lot of experience here. Uh, so, so it's really, we like to say, you know, our company is powered by people, but also innovation. Um, and, uh, we're, we're a super global company. We're, um, you know, we operate in, in almost every country around the world. Uh, have a really strong footprint of our our manufacturing. Have a, bi- a, a big manufacturing here in 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 Canada, but also in Luxembourg, in uh, Shanghai, in India, in Vermont, and and, uh, and then we have a, a really strong footprint for our service organization around the world. So, very global um, uh, company as well. Awesome. Um, so that, and we can get more into Husky as we, as we get into the discussion. But um, so, yeah, I'll tell you a little bit about my background. Um, so, of course, we met at, uh, at Darden at the business school. And, um, um, but my, my uh, original education, initial education is engineering. I'm, I, I uh, have a degree in ocean or marine engineering. Never really worked in uh, marine engineering. Actually went into aerospace uh, after school and uh, then went decided after that to, uh, to go back and, and, uh, get the business degree. Um, from there, I spent the next roughly 30 years working for United Technologies Corporation. Mm. And, um, but most of that time was in the Otis elevator company. Um, and I would say, so about 25 years at the Otis elevator company, gr- another great company, real service that that is a service company, yeah. um, for sure. Um, about half of my time, so about 12 years I spent in either Japan or China. Um, I, I ran the uh, Otis Japan company, uh, also was the leader or president of the Otis brand in, in China. Mm. Um, and then after that, I came <laughs> back to the, uh, a global role in Otis and led a uh, pretty significant service transformation there, which included a, a big digital component to that mm-hmm. transformation. Um, and then before that in, in UTC and, and Otis did, you know, I'm not going to go through all the different jobs, but uh, a lot of different things. Um, but then actually uh, in 2020 came over to work at Husky to, to really take a really good service business 
uh, more of a traditional service business and, and transform it into a more proactive and predictive uh, service business. And that's what I've been doing since 2020 here at uh, Husky. So if I remember, you joined uh, right before COVID started. So there was an interesting transition for you in terms of your physical transformation, in terms of being you know, relocating as well as all the work you need to do in the service business. So, you know, what's interesting about your background, and obviously I knew a little bit about it uh, before, we, uh, before we started this uh, meeting, is that the people I've interviewed either came from traditional engineering roles or operations roles and then moved into service. You were a general manager. You were a country president in Japan and China, and then you kind of came back and led the service transformation, which is a very different path. And then for the last, I'd say, decade or so, you've been really immersed in service, uh, which is an interesting background. So when you think about where you are today as the president of services, how did that um, early experience as a GM president, how did that kind of impact your, your choices or impact how you, uh, how you run the service business today? You know, Vivek, I think um, actually I, I have to go back even further in my career. When, when I started with Otis, uh, I started in a small branch office in Miami, Florida. Um, and as I said, Otis is a service company. Um, it's really deep in the culture. You know, 1852, Elijah Otis, you know, invented the hardware. But uh, 1862, Charles Otis, his son, invented the service contract. So from the very beginning, you know, that company is all about service. And so when I started there in that branch, you know, I actually started working as a service mechanic and, and repair and maintenance and installation. Uh, then I worked in service sales and then I worked in service and installation field operations. And really, you know, it kind of got into my my DNA uh, from uh, from from the beginning. And I, I kind of knew right from the start that that's what I wanted to do. That's what I like to do. That's what actually drove the bit drives business growth. Yeah. You have good service. Customers buy your products. You service those products. They buy more products. And it's, you know, that nice business cycle. So that's how I really, um, you know, I would say got to the point where I said, hey, I, I, I want I want my career to be service. Now, mm -hmm. even when you're running big P&Ls, um, you know, at, at, at Otis, um, it is a lot about service. And, uh, and, and so um, it's just a big part of the, you know, main part of your job. Oh, yeah is to just make sure that, you know, you are delivering on your customers' commitments, you know, delivering on the commitments that, you know, you've made to your customers and, and delivering on the promise. And it's all about that. And, and services is all about that, right? It's yeah. delivering on those commitments. So um, I really enjoy that. I see the value of that. I see the value of getting your employees to really understand that. And, um, you know, that's how, that's how I got really kind of uh, hooked, if you will, in, in, in service. You know, it's interesting what you said. Uh, there's two or three things you said. One is 1862. I cannot believe it's been that long, 160 years since somebody de developed a service contract, right? So that's point number one. Point number two, I do recall, by the way, when you and I were in business school, we did a case in Otis, if you remember, the, remote, the original remote monitoring case. I think yeah. it was in operations, if I remember correctly. But the other thing that you mentioned, which is you're the probably the third person who said to me, and I'm surprised we don't hear this more often, is that service gives you a continuing relationship and an ability and an opportunity to deliver an experience a customer remembers all the time. And therefore, she will come back to you when she's ready to do something different and new. And people seem to forget that, right? I mean, people seem to forget that this continuing relationship that service has is an incredibly powerful experience, marketing, sales, whatever you want to call it, opportunity. Yet, I hate to say this, but the bulk of the leadership in American, I want to say American manufacturing companies, literally, seems to overlook this most obvious of secrets, if you may, right? It is. It is really, it is pretty, it is amazing. There's a lot of product com companies that don't understand the value of that. And, and, you know, and they have, you know, big install bases, you know, big customer you know, network and really don't get, get that. And, you know, that the, the value prop, prop proposition of that is enormous. Yeah. Um, 
you know, and that's what we're doing at Husky. You know, we really, we have a, we have a, a great product. We have a great footprint, great service organization because, you know, you always need to have in a global company, you need to be close to your customer. You can't do it all from, you know, Toronto, Canada, you need to be close to your customer. So we have that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, now we couple that with the, the ability to be more proactive. You know, we, we've all, we were already very responsive. Now we, we add that proactive piece to it. And, yeah. uh, you know, we're finding that. And, and by the way, today it's even more critical to have that ability with this, the, the, the demographics changing and the, 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 the skilled talent shortage that there is for service technicians um it's just you know it, it it's a tremendous value proposition that is great for your customers and great for the business growth as well you know if you think about the the last part you said i, don't, I want to come back to that in a second but i want to go back to this customer experience and the the hidden i mean you know, there's i had done some analysis many years ago when i first settled in title about one of our customers data sets right for this is a company that sold uh, instrumentation, uh, lab instrumentation, and what's interesting, Tony, is to the point you mentioned earlier. For every transaction where they sold an equipment or a machine, there were 30, 40, 50 transactions over the next decade or fifteen years where the the service or consumables or parts were touching that machine. Something was happening, and that. Frequency of touches can be leveraged in many ways. You're using it to deliver proactive service, but you can drive the customer um, experience value from there as well. You know, I would think that it's almost like instead of calling you the president of service, it's almost like you're the chief customer officer to some degree, right? I mean, if you think about that. Right. I mean, we, we call our service organization, you know, it is a customer-centric organization. I mean, on my business. <laughs> card i you know my title says president of service and and quality experience um because that's you know that's again what we we want to make sure the quality experience or the experience over the life of the product is is um you know we're, is is there and we we you know what we we talk about here at husky is we we call it commitment made delivered and maintained and mm. and that's across the entire experience. So when we, we deliver, you know, the, the, the Husky machine or the Husky mold, uh, we want to deliver it with the right quality. We want to deliver it on time. And when, when the customer starts it, it needs to meet, you know, those nameplate mm -hmm. uh, performance requirements, but it's not done there, right? right. We don't say goodbye. Right. We, we want to maintain the commitment all the way through the life of the equipment Right. Um, that nameplate performance all the way through, you know, 10, yeah. 15, 20 years until it's time for the customer to buy a new machine. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, over those 20 years, though, to do that, again, it's a partnership where we're making sure the customer, you know, gets the performance that they need. But to do that, that takes, you know, a maintenance contract, a connected solution, takes the spare parts that are required, takes the technical support that's required takes the modernization or the technology updates and upgrades and improvements that are required from, you know, those 20 years. And, you know, when the 20 years are done, the customer, it's, it's really easy for the customer to say, I just, wow, you know, I've had such a great experience with, with Husky, you know, I'm going to buy a new Husky. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the, but all in this 20 years, there's two things going on. You've been fortunate so far. Actually, all of us have been fortunate so far that for the most part, we've had long tenured employees in these manufacturing businesses who've been there for a long time. I mean, Joe in the shop who's been there for 40 or 50 years, or, you know, Al who's a service guy for 60 years. Believe it or not, uh, when I was with uh, one of the big industrial conglomerates uh, uh, 25 years ago, we literally had people in the 70s who were still working for us mm -hmm. because we refused to let them go. <laughs> and they had so much knowledge that we okay. literally refused to let them go. But now when you start thinking about what's going on with, the, you know, I call it the silver tsunami. People have called it that. The, the great shift changes, uh, somebody I talked to call it that. You know, to me, the things that you're doing, the things that you were doing at Otis and now you're doing at Husky, which is the remote monitoring and diagnostics or the connected uh, service enterprise experience, is a way to A, automate and B, institutionalize this knowledge that was residing in people's brains. But you're now trying to automate that. Is that 
a, a an explicit strategy that you guys are thinking about or is that something that is going to be beneficial because now these retirements won't hamper your business anymore for sure it's a, it's part of our strategy um we you know we we have developed a uh, a capability and uh, a solution <clears throat> we call it advantage plus elite um it's a connected solution um we we actually developed the the analytics and the dashboards uh in-house and i and uh, i think that's uh that's a competitive advantage because uh we we have our best system knowledge people here who understand the you know what really matters yeah. uh, what variables to monitor what what uh insights are important so we developed those and we were able to do it you know pretty quickly we stayed focused and uh developed that you know of course we don't develop an edge device or uh you know the the, the cloud you know we right. use you know, the, the leaders for that but the actual analytics we developed in-house and and we uh we launched this product um two years ago and the the growth of it and the uptake is phenomenal again um compounded because of the silver tsunami effect that's happening yeah. um we we thought you know we're moving into a lot of new markets where we have customers who or who are new to uh the technology brand new to it and we yeah. thought initially we thought this solution would be more uh, applicable for those newer customers but the reality is you know our most experienced customers are facing the same challenges of uh you know trying to to keep that talent and that knowledge so they find a lot of value in in this as well um so yeah, th this has been uh, a very important part of our strategy, and it's really, really, um, it's really, really been successful so far and growing significantly. Um, e every system that we sell today is embedded with uh, with two years of this capability. Uh, it's a two year, um, you know, kind of a subscription for two yep. years. Yep. Um, and uh, again, the customer, you know, the renewability of this has been actually over a hundred percent um because customers you know they 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 try it on their their new system and they see the value of it and they say wow you know i have 10 other machines in my install right. base can you add this to that and uh and we can for the most part um and then so actually you know we like to say our renew our renewal rate you know everybody kind of targets a hundred percent yeah we're, we're getting over a hundred percent um because of the install base that that we're uh, attaching to, that's amazing. So when you when you think of what you're doing today at Husky and your previous experience at Otis, because Otis was, in my mind, one of the leaders or pioneers in the whole remote monitoring and diagnostic for services capabilities. Clearly, Otis had a hundred years to do it. You guys have been doing it for two years or two and a half years since you got there. Uh, what was what were the learnings from Otis in 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 that? Uh, connected connected elevator connected lift uh, to uh, husky that you're going to bring forward because there's a bunch of learnings you guys went through uh that can be that can be brought over what are you what are your yeah, top i think, I think there's three? One, yeah what, one really i i think um okay maybe it's too basic but i'll i'll, I'll say it anyways because I, I think it's important um the the importance of the service technician is uh like, don't ever think the connected solution is going to replace the service technician. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, and so you, we always need to have good service technicians, and we need to have them close to our customers. Yeah. That's that. That that's so. That's a learning, and that you know we've we've kept that, you know that that learning. Um, now, the the capability of the service technicians may. D does change actually because you have you know so, you know those those super techs uh that you used to try to have everywhere right. you don't have to do the super tech everywhere you can have the super techs in your monitoring centers yeah and you can have um you know uh more general techs out uh in the field supporting you so so that that's a very a very important thing that um we also you know so so there is a people factor that that goes with the technology in our solution here we have a a program manager who who talks to the customer every week mm -hmm. uh, and, and goes through what happened in the prior week and opportunities and also so it's a it's a partnership 
Um, so uh, again, what, what, one thing that we, we found very important is it's, you know, the idea of if, if you think it's just about sending out a kind of an automated um, alert, a digital alert yeah. that just says, hey, um, you know, there's a high vibration or there's a high temperature that, that you know, doesn't, you know, customers really are not, it's not going to help them very much. Right. But when you, you add the people factor and then you add also our, you know, our, we, it's called, we call you the message. Um, it goes out and it, 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 it explains the probable root cause. It gives the probable solutions, uh, some troubleshooting guidance. And it's really, so there's a ton of value in those communications. Yeah. And if it's urgent, it's followed with a, it's actually led with a call, mm -hmm. a call to that customer. And we have a classification. So there is, uh, I guess, one big uh, important thing here is there's a really important people factor that you have to marry with the, the you know, the digital technology. Yeah. You know, and I think what you said is actually interesting. So years ago, when I was at this big conglomerate, <laughs> big industrial conglomerate, we were focused on remote monitoring and diagnostics. And for us, we were trying to get to the same kind of productivity leverage, if you may, that you just described, where you don't need to plan super techs or hire super techs in every single location, but they can be more centralized than monitoring centers or have access to this monitor. And then you can get by with less experience, less uh, technically astute techs in the field to get things done. So that's one productivity aspect. The other thing that I, I thought we did well back in those days, as a, and I think you mentioned this to me when you and I spoke uh, a few weeks ago, is when you ship the machine with a two-year subscription to your connected uh, uh, service, you also make that, I think you said, maybe I misheard you, part of your service contract as well, right? So it kind of helps you make that service contract more effective. Is that correct, Tony? Yes, that is, it is in effect, um, it, it, it's in effect coming with a... Um, uh, a two-year service contract. Okay. Um, at, yes. No, that, 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 that's, and that again is, um, I think a, a customers really appreciate getting, you know, that right from the start, like don't wait until, you know, a year and then come back and yeah. try to do that. Customers want to, and need actually the support right from the start. Yep. So it's, you know, we start them. We we actually with when we when we sell a new machine, it, it comes with um, a, an actual startup by our technician, and then it goes right into the connected solution. So mm. from the very beginning, the customer we're together with the customer, and you know that commitment maintained is really serious. Like we, it's not just uh, a, you know a bunch of words. We we take it really serious. We we measure it. Um, so in addition to, you know, we're meeting with the, every customer every week, um, I have an operational meeting with my team every week. And I look mm -hmm. at, you know, anybody who is uh, below a certain performance level, they get spiked out on a dashboard. Mm -hmm. And I'm asking the question, you know, why is that customer below the performance level? What are we doing to get them back on nameplate performance? So mm -hmm. not only are we monitoring, you know, we're actually actually internally in our operational team uh, looking at it by customer every week and uh, you know really keeping our customers on target. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pick on the thread some more for for a couple of reasons. One is you talked about the fact that you're not just monitoring it and making sure there's a prescription or action that needs to happen. You're monitoring the performance level of your customers. So your customers' health is what you're watching. The second thing you said is you have, you've basically attached what we in the software world call a customer success manager to your customer operations manager's hip to make sure that he or she has that support they need. And the third thing is you're basically tying it to your view of how the business is running today. Now, you know, what's interesting is the this whole notion of customer success that you're marrying with this connected service is an important way to make sure adoption and success happens in your customer base as well. Uh, we see that in our business also, by the way. We also attach a customer success manager to our customers for much the same reason. Do you think that this, this model of person plus technology is what's going to be required for the next few years till this becomes more of a widespread adoption, Tony? Because, you know, I've always watched this notion of IoT or remote monitoring and diagnostics and have said, but obvious, right, it should happen. 
but the adoption rate has been extraordinarily slow, I think, in industry. And I wonder if the model you have is what's required for most companies to jumpstart that adoption. Uh, you know? uh, yeah, I, I really, for me, it's been a pretty eye-opening to see the importance of that. Um, of course, you need to be able to scale it. You know, the, the first question is, how do you scale something like that? Um, we're, we're, you know, we, we're, we're developing the, the tools and the capabilities to allow us to scale it. So we're not concerned about the scalability. We, you know, we're, we have that on our radar and it's part of actually part of the, you know, the, um, uh, the modules that we continue, we, we've released over 11, actually 11 specific, mm. 11 modules um, for Advantage Plus Elite. And those modules um, are adding, some, some of them are, are more focused on um, new capabilities and, um, for the customer, and some are to improve the um, ability to scale, you know, the, the uh, scale what we're talking about here, which is having, you know, these program managers assigned to each uh, customer. Right. Um, so, yeah, but, but the answer to your question is yes. I, I think, um, I think it's very important. We, you know, we, we measure, um, they're, they're measured on, on customer success also. So their annual objectives are measured on that. And, uh, and actually mine are as well. So, um, you know, it's not just about, you know, business growth. It's about making sure our customers succeed. Yeah. Um, yeah, so. you know when you when you when you think about the transition you've been through in terms of Otis, which is heavily uh, IoT oriented, uh, Husky, where you're introducing this stuff. Uh, look again, like you, I was introduced to IoT or remote monitoring diagnostic 25, 30 years ago. I've just been surprised that it hasn't taken off as much as it should have. This is 2023, because I always tell people, look, the world's fleets are still 95 percent not connected. Right. Again, at Husky, as much as you're shipping every new machine with the connected uh, uh, Vantage Elite uh, uh, service, I'd say, you know, I don't know what the number is, but a substantial percentage of install base is still unconnected or will get connected. How long do you think pragmatically before you and I see a uh, more ubiquitous uh, IoT kind of mindset everywhere? Uh, huh. Oh, that's a, that's a, I mean, the, the, so for us, everything we sell now is, is connected. Sure. And, um, you know, we're actually extending that even beyond, you know, even to our tooling. So mm -hmm. everything, everything is connected. So going forward, you know, it's a hundred percent, right? Just the way we, you know, we're, we're selling a product and a service period and it comes yeah. together. It's not, it's not a product. It's, it's, it's part of the product. Yeah. Um, so, Going forward, you know, it's it's 100 percent now getting back into the install base there, you know, in our install base, not everything can be connected with the mm -hmm. technology we have. So some of it, you just it's difficult. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you just have to wait till that asset is renewed and then yeah. or upgraded because we yeah. do, um, you know, as we every control upgrade that we sell today, we, we that is packaged with Advantage Plus Elite. Um, and because we can do that. Um, so the question is how long, um, I don't know, I'd be guessing, but, um, you know, I think it's real, not, not fast enough, not really. fast, enough, not I fast know. enough. Again, I think, you know, part of the problem is there's an, there's a, there's an effort to try to do too much with it. Um, and then you don't really get, you just, there's no focus and you don't really get anything done and, you know, it's not impactful for the customer. So the customers doesn't really want it. Um, so, you know, I guess back to your lessons learned, you gotta like be really focused. It, it takes just one or two good insights to provide a ton of value. You don't need to have, you know, a hundred different insights, right? You can find just some really, and that's why the system knowledge uh, capability and building the analytics is so important because yeah. those system engineers who have all that experience, they, they can hone in really on what, what is really going to matter. And, and you start with that, just start small and, uh, provide a lot of value with those. And then once you start with those, you know, those, that, that small, um, you know, a couple insights, you start learning a lot actually about other things and then it just grows from there. So, 
I think, you know, every, there, there's so many different companies today offering connected solutions and they just sending alerts. Um, but, you know, that's not what that that's not going to get the uh, kind of the install base connected. It's it's really a, has to be about high impact, very focused um, insights that are going to really help our customers. And we also we don't just um, provide insights on the hardware. We, we go right up the uh, we, we call it the pyramid where, you know, kind of go right up to the master process and the product. And we provide insights on that as well. Um, yeah. You know, er everybody's providing insights on the hardware, but to go up into the subsystem and, and, and all the way up until for us, the master process of how mm -hmm. to actually make the part, um, you know, that providing insights on that is it provides a lot of value for our customers. Yeah. You know, it's actually interesting what you said, the, the three things you said, which I think are have been part of the problem all these years. And I, I, I like the fact that you articulated them. One is be extremely clear about the business value your customer is going to get right off the bat, not your value. Yes, you should care about your value, but business value to the customer matters. B, you're marrying this with a very clear uh, but bounded things to do, right? I mean, I remember this example many years ago uh, in the jet engine business. People said, oh, we monitor 2,000 different parameters. And when you ask the questions, yeah, but there's like five that matter, right? <laughs> right. And so focusing right. this, you know, I know you're, you've done Six Sigma as well, the critical few or whatever you should call them, right? It's really focused on the critical few. The third thing you said, which is I think important, and I've seen it only with one other uh, company that also is a customer of ours, that they assign customer success managers, you call them program managers, but it's really attaching the customer success manager to the uh, customer, to the end user, which really makes a difference in adoption and benefits and all these other things. That, that that's important. So that's actually a really good way to kind of set this thing up. And like you said, unfortunately, this stuff is not moving fast enough. Uh, Tony, I want to switch this just in the last few minutes of this discussion. I'm going to switch to a couple of questions that were on my mind, right? Sure. So you went from being a corporate uh, corporate person, if you may, for almost 25, 30 years. Mm. To, yes, being a corporate guy again, but in a very different framework, a sponsor-owned, a private equity-owned company. I have to believe, and I, <laughs> we had a call with a prospect the other day who told us that we were just bought by a private equity fund and the urgency just ratcheted up, right? <laughs> Did you see that difference between before, I mean, uh, your previous job and your Husky job? Is there material difference in urgency and intensity? Um, you know, no, I, I think the, uh, you know, where I came from, it was, a, it was a real, it, there was an urgency culture there. Um, there was a customer centric culture, but a hot, a very performance, uh, centric, um, you know, kind of culture and urgency so that, that, um, I, I didn't see a big difference. Um, I, I've heard the same thing. Um, I, I didn't see it. There, there's clearly a sense of urgency here as well. Um, it's, it, it is different. It's, um, you know, it, I mean, when I was at Otis, it was 33,000 service technicians and here, you know, it's about 600 service technicians. Um, it's, it's interesting. The company that I'm at here, you know, Husky is as global though, uh, mm -hmm. much smaller, but as global. Um, but I have learned a lot of things from my other experience, you know, Otis experience about global, uh, be, you know, what being really global, global means, yeah. And uh, and I'll just you know I think it's important to just tell you about that because um, to be global, right? You need to, as we we said earlier, you, you know, you need to to be there physically, um, and to be there means a lot of things, right? It means having your service technicians who are there close to your customers. It means having technical support who's there in the time zone in the mm -hmm. local language. It means having your spare parts center or spare yeah. part capability there. So the lead times, you know, spare part lead times have to be next day yeah. anywhere. Yeah. Um, it means, um, yeah. So that that I, I learned that from Otis, and and that's you know at Husky we're very global, and we're really pushing that to really make sure we're we're, we're doing that um, to be really global, so that we can yeah. be present, really be present for. Um, any opportunity or any problem that comes up. Yeah, that's actually, uh, 
I, I just read that the other day somewhere. I was reading some uh, some uh, some article about some global leader, and he said exactly the same thing, which is global doesn't mean you can centralize stuff. Global means being there it on does. the ground where your customers and where your people are. So that's great. It's kind of um, it's kind of like um, you know, I guess you could call it a company an exporter to a real global company. Yeah. An exporter tries to just kind of do everything from a centralized place, yeah. but if you really want to be global, you really, really need to uh, to physically be there. Yeah. You know, one last question on this notion of sponsor on a private equity owned thing. Uh, when you were brought into Husky, was it because your uh, private equity owners had a specific deal thesis around service? Or was that just a continuation of where they were before? Because I've seen when sponsor owned companies start kind of really get going, they really focus heavily on service and aftermarket like you're doing. Is that, was that a specific point that uh, Platinum made uh, in this regard? Uh, yeah, I, I think, though, it wasn't just, um, you know, Platinum. It was, it was the, you know, the, 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 the CEO here also. They, they yeah. together saw that there was, they saw the opportunity out there, um, but the experience wasn't here, yeah. uh, you know, and so, Again, they, it was really to get to, it was, it was visible, but you know, how, how do you, what, what's the playbook to get there? Yeah, and so that's yeah. why they asked me to come over. Um, I, you know, I, for me, it was, a, it was, a, it is a big change. You know, I worked my whole career at, uh, you know, UTC and Otis. Um, and, uh, you know, I, when, when, um, you know, I was first approached about it, I really kind of, you know, I was like, I was actually at the time living in Florida and, you know, Florida, Canada, <laughs> um, you know, big, this giant service company, yeah. small. Um, but then I, I, I came and they were like, come on, just come talk to us. And I came and uh, met the people here really. And again, like the, the nice things about Husky is similar to where I came from, right? It's a, a industry leader, you know, market leader, um, super strong brand strong people um so with all that and then i met you know the people here met the ceo really said wow i think i can i can uh take what i've learned in the last 25 years and and try it here and and add a lot of value and so i decided to to do it and i really really enjoyed it it's been um it, it's been a, a good run and and uh still a lot, a lot to do but but great okay. Excellent. Well, I'm going to wrap it up with a more broad question, career question. So when I think of the business school you and I went to, it is very type A, very intense school. Uh, UTC, Otis was not that different from where I did my early part of the career with GE. Very intense, very, you know, very, very type A type of people. Uh, and But there was no culture in the past for people like you and me to wind up in services or wind up in the mm -hmm. aftermarket. Do you think that's going to change? with uh, what, Or what's it going to take to have people like you and me in services, because candidly, there just weren't that many people like you and me in services. Right. No, that's interesting. Um, I still think, yeah, there's not enough. There's not enough of us out there today. It's it. You know, it's true. And um, I, I, it's I, wow. I don't. I don't know what it's going <laughs> to take. I, I, you know, I, I do like when I, I do meet a lot of. Um, I try to meet, you know, as many uh, new new employees and interns and. I think it's just it, it's awareness because yeah. um, when you know when when you get that exposure to what it really is and what the opportunities are and the potential is um, you know there, there's a lot of interest. It, it's it's I think it starts with just more awareness about what service is um, and what the potential is. Um, and yeah, and 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 giving that awareness, there there is you know, um, it it's harder to find a company also that um, is really uh, has a service culture, but but also provides a you know the the end to end um, experience experience from you know from design through you know selling and manufacturing and installing and servicing and um, so, um, that, that also, I think w when I talk to, uh, people coming into their careers, that's one thing I, I tell them is if you can find a, an opportunity in a company like that, um, 
and, and work in service. Um, it's great because you're working really from the customer. Uh, you know, you're starting right. At the right place, and you're really learning from the customer, um, which is what I did when I, you know, I yeah. you know, talked about. I started in that branch, and you know, the my first, very first experience is <clears throat> customers, and then you. And then you work up, you know, and you get into the P&L roles and the other roles. But to me, it's the best way to actually start a career is uh, is in service. Yeah, you know, Tony, I'll make one last observation as we wind up this call. But, but what you just said is actually interesting. So you and I, again, when we go back to business school, uh, when I used to go back to Darden to kind of talk to students, I used to say, look, there are two things that I wish I had paid attention to and I wish they had taught when we were you know, Darden. One is... <laughs> what we used to call the arts and crafts class writing. I mean, it's unbelievable how bad people write and communicate, right? So that is an undersold, underappreciated uh, thing in business school. The second thing that never taught you and me was selling, the art of mm -hmm. selling, right? I mean, think about it. There's no sales 101 class in business school, at least that, not that I know of. The third right. thing I think, I think you and I, I don't want to volunteer you and I to do this, but I almost think there needs to be a service 101 class. Yes, we yeah. had that, but there's nothing along the lines what you just talked about, and it's right. everything from the mechanics of uh, the, the no, no pun intended, but the mechanics of service to the customer experience piece of it, to the technology piece of it, to the full aspect of what it means to deliver value to a customer. It's right. almost like they need to create that class for not just business school students, but just kids coming out of school now. I, mean, I think it's just yeah. unbelievable out there. No, know? I think I think I agree. I think that's a great idea. I think the other, you know, to add to that customer experience that. Kind of a gap that you know I think is um, I see is is uh, the just the, again the the customer centricity and you know the, the the buzzword of customer empathy. But um, you know I was I was I was talking to a couple people actually I was just at a customer uh, a few days ago and you know I was there because the customer wasn't happy um, and you know. I was explaining, trying to explain empathy, and and, I was, and it really is like, just just force yourself to put yourself in that customer's shoes and think about what they're experiencing, and and just force yourself to do. If you can do that, you will succeed with yep. the customer, and, and that's Absolutely. what we did at this customer. You know, I really just, you know. I understood where where he was coming from, and he was right, you know, because yeah. from his perspective, you know, he had a problem, and you know, he needed help, and and so you know, you just you 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 do that, and you listen, and you give solutions, and you know, your customer is, is with you. So, I think, you know, the one on one, what is service, but also one on one, like customer empathy, oh, what, what did it really mean, and and how to how to actually get that mindset. Maybe this is what you and I can do after we retire. So anyway. <laughs> good. Good. Well, Tony, this has been absolutely fabulous. I think the, the range of uh, topics we touched was great in terms of your early uh, career, the, the, the remote monitoring and IoT kind of service, customer empathy, customer experience, and then uh, bringing it all together uh, was really, really uh, powerful in my mind. So I appreciate the time you spent with me today. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, getting this thing out in the uh, on the podcast world. And uh, again, Tony, thank you so much. I know you have a busy, uh, busy schedule. So I appreciate you taking the time today. Thanks, Vic. Good right, care. Take care. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.